Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one is one that was highly in demand. I didn't know anything about this, I've never heard of this, and many people, I think they're Australians. This is in Australia, right? Well, like, Simon, Snowy Mountain Hydroelectric Scheme, make it happen. So I did. You're welcome. Let's get started. The largest engineering project Australia has ever seen lies within the boundaries of the Kosciuszko National Park in New South Wales. And it's an absolute beast! The Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Scheme incorporates 16 major dams, 9 power stations, 2 pumping stations, countless pipelines and aqueducts, and roughly 225 kilometers, that's 140 miles of tunnels, all designed to funnel the precious water down from the Snowy Mountains to the Mare Darling Basin below and Australia's thirsty, irrigated agriculture industry, as well as providing much needed energy. It's a win-win. This was a mega project of staggering proportions that took 25 years to complete and involved over 100,000 workers. In a country where water scarcity is still having an enormous impact, the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Scheme was able to utilize the natural elements to provide vital water to the local area. If you can reach your minds back to the early days of 2020, oh, the glorious time before COVID, you may remember the horrifying images of the Australian bushfires. Great swaths were set alight as fires tore through huge patches of the country, adding up to an estimated 46 million acres of burning land that's bigger than the entire state of Florida, by the way. But while this was undoubtedly disastrous, this is not the longest running or most severe ecological problem unfolding in Australia. You see, newsflash, humans, plants, and animals need water to survive. And unfortunately for Australia, it doesn't have enough, or at least it's not always been in the right place. The land down under is perhaps not the ideal place to house a nation that currently has over 25 million people, but it seems unlikely that they're going to just up and move anytime soon. Water scarcity has been an issue for decades now, with numerous causes including a booming population, deforestation, overgrazing, extensive agriculture, and of course, the overriding threat of climate change. <laughs> All kind of put down to too many people. Australia has done its best to lower water consumption, but it remains firmly in the top 10 most water-hungry nations in the world, consuming roughly 100,000 litres of fresh water per person per year. Wowie. Efforts have increasingly focused on maximising the water that the country does have, and that brings us nicely back to the Snowy Mountains Hydroelectric Scheme. Manipulating river flow to increase water levels isn't new. As far back as the 1800s, the nearby Murray and Murrumbidgee rivers had experienced some kind of human intervention. But for a long time, the Snowy River, which winds through the Australian Alps, has never been touched. Much of it eventually flows into the Pacific Ocean, but takes with it a significant amount of melted snow and ice from the southeastern New South Wales snowfields, water that could be used elsewhere. Shortly after World War II, a series of proposals emerged regarding the scheme. The first focused almost solely on irrigation, while the second incorporated a much broader use of the water and called for several dams and power stations. But the moment you start mentioning dams and diverting rivers, you always are going to come up against opposition, and so it was with this early design. In 1948, a report by the Australian government was published, which outlines a much more expansive plan than before, and this would focus on both irrigation and power generation, and a year later the Australian states involved and their main government finally came to a workable agreement, and the vast project inched forward towards reality. The idea behind this was fairly straightforward. Melting snow and ice which accumulates in the snowy mountains travels down as water runoff and is captured by the various newly formed lakes and reservoirs below, sometimes travelling through purpose-built tunnels to get there. This water then passes through the dams and power stations, creating electricity. The same water then continues out of the other side and down into the Murray and Murrumbidgee rivers, where it can be distributed through various irrigation channels to the agriculture industry who are desperate for water. So everybody's happy. The farmers get their water and home dwellers get their electricity. Wonderful. One interesting fact about the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme that we should probably start with was the extraordinary diverse nationalities included in the project. As many as 32 different nations were represented during construction, accounting for roughly two-thirds of the total manpower, many coming from Europe in search of a stable, well-paid job. Considering construction began in 1949, just four years after the end of the war that had left Europe a smoldering wreck, it was common for groups who had been at war with each other a matter of years before to now be working side by side. Much of the scheme was modeled on the Tennessee Valley Authority, a similar venture in, well, 
Tennessee. The United States even provided technical assistance and trained engineers for the project. In total, the scheme covers an area of roughly 5,124 square kilometers, which is bigger than the whole of the Grand Canyon National Park. The first to go in was the vast network of roads and railways measuring some 1,600 kilometers in length to be used by the heavy machinery later in the project. Additionally, before any major construction work could be started, the thousands of workers employed on the project needed somewhere to live. The result was the creation of seven different townships and over 100 separate camps. Two of these townships, Cabramara and Kangaban, have since become permanent towns, with Cabramara holding the distinction of being the highest town in Australia. But where new towns appeared, others were lost or rather moved. One outcome of the scheme was the vast reservoirs that appeared in the valley as a result of the damming. In total, they contained water equal to the volume of 13 Sydney harbours and forced the relocation of several towns. The project included 16 major dams, all completed between 1955 and 1970. I'm not about to go through them all here, that would be incredibly boring, but we will give you a little bit of a taster. The first was the Cathaga Dam, a concrete gravity dam that stands at 34 meters and stretches to a length of 139 meters. It contains roughly 44,100 cubic meters of concrete, and its two turbines have an installed capacity of 60 megawatts. The largest is the Yukumbin Dam, which was completed in 1958. The dam wall contains 6.735 million cubic meters of earth and the rock fill is 116 meters high and 579 meters long. It also created the largest reservoir of the whole project with a capacity of 4.8 million liters. It also has a total area of nearly 36,000 acres, just slightly smaller than the whole of Washington, D.C. And while we're talking about the Yucumbian Reservoir, we might as well talk about the tunnels. Quite amazingly, only 2% of the construction work done on the scheme is visible from the air. 145 kilometers of tunnels and 80 kilometers of pipelines were built to divert water from the snowy mountains down into the reservoirs and two of the longest terminates at or near the Yukumbin Reservoir. The 22.2 kilometer long Yukumbin Tamut Hub Tunnel diverts water from the Snowy River to the Tamut River before dumping everything into the Tamut Pond Reservoir. That's impressive, but another one just about edges it out. The crown of the longest tunnel goes to the 23.5 kilometer long Yukumbin Snowy Hub Tunnel with a circular diameter of 6.3 meters and which connects the Yukumbin Gumbin River to the Snowy River. Then we have the seven hydroelectric power stations completed by 1974 and an additional three which have been built since. By far the biggest in terms of electrical output is the Tamut 3 power station. But yes, in case you were wondering, there is a Tamut 1 and Tamut 2, but they pale in comparison to number 3. Tamut 3 was the first major pumped hydro plant built in Australia when it was completed in 1973 and remains the largest of its kind to date. Water is pulled through six pipelines, each measuring 488 meters long and 5.6 meters in diameter, coming from the Junama Pondage at the rate of 297 cubic meters per second before moving through the six Toshiba turbines, generating a huge electrical output of 1,650 megawatts, enough to power over a million average homes. All in all, the nine power stations and 33 turbines they include have a generating capacity of 4,100 megawatts. The expensive project that is the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme was officially completed on the 21st of October 1972 with the grand opening of the Timut 3 power station at a total cost of 820 million Australian dollars in 1974, which today is about 7.6 billion Australian dollars. Over the 25 years, 121 people died during the various construction projects. The most serious incident occurred on the 16th of April 1958, when an elevator fell around 121 meters after the cable snapped, killing four Italian employees. The immediate impact of the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme has been quite remarkable. It provides 2,100 gigaliters of water a year to be used in Australia's irrigated agriculture industry, which itself is worth around 3 billion Australian dollars a year, around 40% of the gross value of the nation's agricultural production. When you think that one gigaliter is a billion liters, you start to get an idea of the huge amount of water this is. As I've just mentioned, the power stations are throwing out a huge amount of electricity per year, which equates to around 4,500 gigawatt hours of renewable electricity. But everything certainly isn't all green and rosy. As you can imagine, with large-scale water diversion, it has caused its fair share of environmental issues. When the scheme was first set out, the plan was to divert 99% of the natural water flow along the Snowy River into the vast network. However, it soon became apparent that this was causing severe knock-on effects further down the river, including erosion, the 
destruction of natural habitat, and an increase in salinity. Since then, there has been plenty of debate and more than a little blind arguing about what percent of the natural water should flow down the Snowy River. Broadly speaking, it has been climbing, and in 2017, Snowy Hydro, the company that runs the entire system, announced that the target of 21% would soon be achieved. <laughs> But we might not be finished there, with Snowy Hydro 2.0 now on the horizon. This is a project that will link two existing dams, the Tantangara and the Talbingo, through 27 kilometers of tunnels, while also providing a new underground power station which will pump out an additional 2,000 megawatts. Snowy Hydro calls the project a win-win, which is probably a bit rich and should no doubt be taken with a pinch of salt considering who it's coming from. If all goes to plan, the new power station will begin generating power in 2025, with an estimated cost for the whole project of between 3 3.8 billion and 4.5 billion Australian dollars. But those are the lowest. Others place the cost at close to 10 billion, and while preliminary work has already started on the project, there's no doubt plenty of twists and turns left in this hugely expensive addition. Australians are a proud bunch, in case you didn't know already, and the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme is one of the most celebrated engineering projects. And you can see why. While it may not be perfect, it's undoubtedly a hugely impressive system. As I mentioned earlier in this video, Australia is not exactly blessed with an abundance of water, but what was constructed in this national park is a perfect example of making the most of your situation. But Australians also point to the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme as one of the defining stages in the development of their country. Despite initial fears over competing nationalities during the building work, there was a surprising social harmony among the men who no doubt felt fortunate enough to have escaped the horrors of Europe. Things weren't perfect, of course, but considering the proximity to the hellish days of World War II, it was notable. Many migrants who worked on the project settled in Australia after its completion, and with it came what we consider modern Australia, a far more culturally diverse nation than it had ever been. The Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme not only provided huge amounts of renewable energy and water to places in real need of it, but it was also a project that altered the cultural makeup of the land down under. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Also, if you're looking for more from me, why not check out another channel that I do called Explored, spelled X-P-L-R-D, because apparently I hate fouls. That will be linked to below. It's sort of shorter, little documentary-style pieces on interesting topics, explorations, if you will. Like I say, link below. Please do subscribe if you fancy it. And thank you for watching.